This is the OTP presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. When it's game day for your health coverage, trust Farm Bureau Health Plans to draw up a winning play for you. They've been backing Tennesseans for nearly 80 years. So glad to welcome head coach Brian Callahan after a big win. Congratulations Thank on no- knocking off the Patriots in overtime 20 to 17. I must say it never gets old beating the New England Patriots. No it doesn't. I don't have <laughs> <laughs> It never gets old winning. Um that's always always fun to to be able to get a win no matter who it's against or what team it is, but yeah, I mean there's definitely some AFC uh, love and hate with the most teams in the Patriots these days, so it's always good to get one. Well, they kind of had a 20-year run that was pretty spectacular. They sure that, did. That most teams don't ever get to enjoy. And Yeah. So. It was fun. Yeah, it was good for them. It was good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Sunday was good for us. Yes, it was. It Congratulations was really, again. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was um, really good to see how our team responded against, you know, all the things that sort of went up and back and forth throughout the course of the game. And then to, to find a way to pull it out at the end and the way we played in overtime was pretty impressive. Now, we talked about the physicality in Buffalo. We talked about the physicality in Detroit. And it did not let up at all against the New England Patriots. So now here you are preparing for another game against the Los Angeles Chargers. And we know that Jim Harbaugh will bully any team that he can. They, they play physical football as well. How do you balance preparing your team for another game mm-hmm. with managing a lot of bumps and bruises and other things that this team is dealing with right now? That's the challenge. Um, is to, to practice enough where you feel like you're ready to go play and to be able to rest, manage, load manage, all those things of all the guys that have things that they're working through. And then there's always a cumulative effect uh, down the roster when you have guys that miss practice. Well, then they other guys, the backups practice more and the practice squad practices more. And then at one point I looked up and practice last week and the three practice squad receivers went from doing the scout team for the – defense and they just walk, went right back and just started running the offense so they, they never had a break and so they their load goes sky high and so that's when you start to see their injuries pop up as they overload what they should be doing for them so anyway it's a it's a long-winded way of saying that that's a that's the challenging part of the season and, and our bye being at week five it feels like we never had one um at this point you know and now we got a lot of games in front of us so have to be really smart uh, a little bit creative on how we manage the practice week and what we do with the players and how we uh, structure walkthroughs versus practice and all those things. So yeah, it's only thing that matters is what we look like on Sunday. And, and my goal is to get our team there as fresh and as feeling as good as possible by the next game. You shouted out some guys specifically in your Monday press conference. And uh, I'd like for you to, to comment on that a little bit further. The first one I want to talk about is a guy who didn't practice at all last week, running back Tony Pollard. Yeah, just an incredible effort. Um, he is, he is, a phenomenal football player um, and I mean that in every sense of the word uh, he he does things right all the time he's one of the most consistent people we have both in personality and in play um, he didn't practice one snap all week but he was engaged and paying attention and ready to go uh, knew that he was going to play and then to go out there off of off of no practice and perform that <laughs> with that and, and not feeling great. I mean, he didn't he didn't practice for a reason. I mean, he's he was banged up and he was hurting and um, to go out there and, and put it on the line for for his teammates and, and our and our organization is uh, everything you could ever want in a player. And I told him after the game, I just I appreciate the effort. I appreciate your professionalism. I, one of my favorite football players I've I've ever been around, and um, he's he's just really fun to watch play football. The first defensive player that you mentioned was Amani Hooker, and I'm guessing that that has more to do with the way he played than just the two interceptions. Mm-hmm. That's what you know. That's where you know Amani's really made plays and been in the right places, and he's played a good brand of football as of late too. And and he's been had done a really nice job, and in a very similar way that Tony was, he barely practiced this week too. Uh, and to see him go in there and play the way he did and, and create some major momentum for us and getting two turnovers are all things that, that we've needed desperately. Yeah, so I want to ask about the last play. Because when we saw May release the ball, we saw Booty the receiver, and we're thinking, this is a touchdown. Mm-hmm. And then out of nowhere, here comes Amani, 
and he intercepts the pass. Did you have the same sort of feeling? Did your did your heart drop well into your stomach for for just a second? Yeah. Anytime that you see, um, you know, I, I I recognized their act, the play they had. They ran like a play action protection, and when I saw him take the drop, I was like, and then he. he Anytime you see a quarterback rearing up to throw like that, that usually means they got something they like. Now, whether it's there for the entirety of the play, but initially when they, when he hauled off and let the ball go, my eyes went right to the secondary because I knew what was happening. I knew they were trying to take a shot down the field. Uh, and then just to see where Hook kick back over and, and, and go run down the ball uh, was was one, just great instinct. Two, knew where he was supposed to be, uh, and he got there in a hurry. And that was a huge play because initially they did. It was, he had a shot at it, um, but Hook went and took it away. I, too, was thankful for the wind, <laughs> that he was <laughs> yeah. throwing into the wind a little yeah. bit because it uh, seemed like it might have hung up just a wee bit. Just enough. Just uh, enough. I mean, the wind, and the wind was a factor. I mean, we, we took the ball at, at the coin toss when we won it. We took the ball because of that. We wanted to make sure if we needed the wind, we needed it in the fourth quarter. Uh, that's why we did it. Um, so that's that's the wind was a factor, and so sure. it probably was a factor on the throw. All right, so you want to ask about a couple more guys he shouted out. A couple out. more shout-outs. Yes. You also mentioned Daniel Brunskill and Corey Levin. Tell yeah. me why. Uh, just pressed into duty, and, and neither one of those guys has played a lot yet this year. Now, obviously, Danny's played a lot of football in his career, so knew I wasn't worried about him going in and performing. He's performed for a long time. So it was just good to have a guy like him ready to roll and step in at that right guard spot and play well. Uh, Corey obviously has played too, but he hasn't played for us, and, and we brought him in halfway, you know, a couple couple weeks into the season, been on the practice squad, um, but to get elevated for the game and then have to step in and play, um, I mean, there's a couple of plays that he did. A, I mean, a really really nice job. I mean, you saw their experience, and so having two experienced guys that have played uh, played some uh, as as starters, you know, was goes a long way when you need them in those moments. And both those guys, I thought played Danny in particular played really really good football for us that a lot of gave us a chance to win a football game so let's talk about the offensive line a little bit because with Lloyd Cushenberry out you made it clear that if Dylan Radins can come back and play at right guard then Brunskill will take over at center so two questions out of that number one are you optimistic about Radins being able to come back in time for the Chargers game and why do you believe that Brunskill is the right answer at center um, the first question, I, I just, I, I, I thought um, Dylan was close this last week. Um, again, we'll see. You don't necessarily really know until you get into the meat of the week, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, see how they feel. Uh, so hopeful, optimistic, but uh, you know, I can't say for certain that he'll be ready to go or not at this point. Um, but Brunskill's really been repping as that interior swing, and so he takes a ton of reps at center. He really has been the backup center because Corey's in the practice squad. So with Ruppich, that's the one that kind of gets lost here is that Ruppich went to IR too, so we've really lost uh, we lost our starting center and our interior swing guard. And so now Brunskill kind of takes both of those spots. So we've got some gymnastics there roster-wise, but uh, he's repped at the, all three interior spots Brunskill has. And so to have him and have that – um, flexibility to play center was was really important. So he's taken quite a few center reps over the time, and uh, he's he's geared up for that because he's such a smart player, and it, it's good to have that guy in the middle. But those guys are going to be critical factors for us here uh, moving forward with Lloyd's injury, unfortunately, um, and, and Ruppich as well. So, you know, we really lost two interior linemen in the last two weeks, and, and that's difficult, but those guys have made it a lot easier to absorb because of uh, their experience. With Quandre Diggs out at safety, does Mike Brown get the first shot to win that job? Yeah, he will. I mean, he's the most experienced. He's played the most. Um, you know, we're going to have to bring in some reinforcements from somewhere, whether it's a practice squad elevation or a free agent sign. There, there's going to be some moving parts because we have to go f see what else is out there too. But we just – we need we need more depth at safety right now. We just don't have enough um, with, the, with the injuries we've incurred. And so Mike will get the first shot and be the likely guy to take that role for now. But we'll see where, where it all ends up as we get through the early part of the week. Okay, I've got three areas – of significant statistical improvement. Not easy to say. No. Significant <laughs> statistical improvement from the win. Amy's got the first one. I do have the first one. For the first time this year, the Tennessee Titans won the turnover battle over the New England Patriots. Is that the best reason that the Titans won the game on Sunday? Um, it certainly goes a long way. <laughs> you know, it's something that we've spent a lot of time trying to get rectified and 
Um, there's no greater stat to wins and losses than the turnover margin. Um, and it's, you know, the more times you turn it over, the or I should say the more times you're in the minus, uh, the more likely it is you are to lose. And on the flip side, the more into the plus you are, plus one, plus two. Is, I think if you're plus two, you win something close to like 80% of your games. You know, that's it's a huge factor in winning and losing in the NFL. Um, and, and we finally came out on the, on the top side of it, and that's what put us in position to win. I like this one, the second statistical advancement. The Titans offense entered the game with three and outs on 30% of your drives this season. In Sunday's win over the Patriots, just one three and out in 11 drives, and that actually came in your final offensive possession in regulation when you ran the ball three times situationally. Yep. So why is improvement in that area such a big deal for the Tennessee Titans and the offense in particular? We're moving the ball. You know, we've moved the ball in the scoring position um, quite a few times in the game. Now, we didn't come up with – I mean, 20 points was the minimum of what we should have scored, and, and we really – without that red zone interception, um, you know, I felt like we had a chance to score more points. Like, I, I thought we could have been closer to the 20, 28 to 30 range. Um and so that was disappointing, but we moved the ball with some consistency. It's really two weeks in a row now. Even the Detroit game in the first half, we moved the ball well, and, and we didn't incur a lot of three and outs or a lot of third down misses. Uh, we converted third downs at a good rate yesterday, and that sort of play is what we're hoping to see more of. And now we have to capitalize and we get a chance to score. You know, again, going 2-5 five in a red zone isn't usually going to get it done, but um, – we've moved the ball a lot and we've moved it well at times. And just that consistency that we've created is kind of each week we've gotten better and better. And so that's good to see. All right, Mike, here's the last one. I think this is very interesting. The Patriots ran 27 plays on first down and gained just 82 yards. So that's three yards per play, which obviously is good, but going a little bit deeper than the obvious, why is first down defense like that so significant? You, you force teams into down and distances they don't want to be in. You know, if you if you can keep uh, a team like that, who who relies heavily on the run game um, with a young quarterback, if you can keep them behind the sticks and second and seven plus, now you you force them into spots where you have to throw the football. You get them in the third and third and six or seven plus. You they stay in second and eight or nine. Those, those are the down and distances you want to keep an offense like that in that that's relying on the run game and has a young quarterback and put them into situations that are to our advantage, which uh, we felt good about those. And that's generally how we've played early in the year as well. Like we got put into some bad down and distances kind of off the game script and uh, second and tens, third and nines. Those are really hard down and distances to consistently convert. And if you can keep an offense in those spots, um, you, you increase your level of, uh, or I should say odds of success you know, substantially when they're when those down in distances. Hey, Titans fans, celebrate each Titans win and enjoy the sweet taste of victory with a free donut at Kroger the very next day. Just download your digital coupon to score your free donut at any Kroger store. It's our way of saying thanks. Now, let's be clear. It's one free donut per transaction while supplies last. Kroger, fresh for everyone and official grocer of the Tennessee Titans. Tighten up. Home is at the forefront of all that we do. It's why we're so committed to caring for the places and spaces in which we work and live. Ashley, the official furniture provider of the Tennessee Titans. We continue with Titans head coach Brian Callahan. Coach, I want to ask you about Jack Gibbons because he had 14 tackles and half a sack in the win over the Patriots. With him playing so well, new guy Jerome Baker didn't get a chance to get on the field on Sunday. But do you still plan to get Baker in the rotation some? Yeah, we're the, you know we're going to need everybody at this point. We got a lot of games left to play, and, and the way that the the NFL league world works is you know guys get dinged up, miss time. We're going to need guys to be ready to play and. You know, it's it's of no um, – there's it's nothing against Jerome. It's really just Gibby playing at an incredibly high level th- the last two games. I mean, he's he has been physical. He's been um, a tackling machine. I mean, he's done everything that he can possibly do to keep that job. And that's who he's sort of always been. And um, to see that, that with another opportunity – to go play, you can see that he's not willing to let that one go very easily, and he's playing football at a high level. And so, hard for us to take him out when he's playing the way he's playing. 
Um, and again, that's not a slight to anything that Jerome Baker is or is not. It's just Jack's playing really good football. And it gives Jerome a chance to fit in and get that hamstring a little better. Maybe not the worst thing in the world. Yeah, it's it's. There's definitely you know there's some familiarity, some communication, um, just getting more familiar with the defense. Even though there's a similar system in Seattle that he came from, but you know just to that's never going to be a bad thing to just be around and not have to get thrust into something that maybe you're not fully ready for at the moment. But um, and again, it's just more. It's really just more Jack playing football at a level that is. Um, it's winning football, and, and there's really no reason to take him out if that's the case. Brian, did we see Jeffrey Simmons' best game of the year this past Sunday? Uh, it sure felt like he's been playing good for the last couple of weeks, but but he really made an impact um, in that game, in the game, and, and you can see uh, the physicality in the run game, the the effort to get to the quarterback, the disruptive nature that he plays with. Um, that was a really good a really good performance by by Big Jeff, and again, I think he's he's had a couple of weeks in a row now where he's starting to to really affect the game, um, both in the run and the pass. And um, that's really good to see. We need every bit of it. Is your hope that when you get on the practice field Wednesday, Will Levis will be able to step in and take the first team reps? That's the, that's the hope. And, and we're going to, we're going to work towards that this week. And um, I think he's in, a, he was in a pretty good place at the end of last week, felt good, but not great. And we want to make sure when he goes to play, he, he's not even thinking about his shoulder. So the plan is to get him going this week and see how he responds with the with the optimism that he's he's pretty pretty dang close to being ready to play. Why don't we go ahead and look forward and get your first thoughts on the upcoming opponent, the Los Angeles Chargers? Yeah, um, I, I've known uh, played against Harbaugh's for a long time. Um, I've known the style of football they're going to play. Uh, it's going to be all of that. Um, they're 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 physical on offense. They got a good young line. J.K. Dobbins is playing at a really high level. Um, and then, of course, they got Justin Herbert, who I think is one of the, the, the premier quarterbacks in the league. And um, they got a defense that really has flipped um, from what they were last year to this year. I think Jesse Minter is a, a really, really sharp defensive coordinator. He kind of comes from the same tree as, as Denard. Um, spent a lot of time in Baltimore with Mike McDonald, went to Michigan with, with Harbaugh. And just talented young coach as well. And then you see his, his fingerprints on that defense. And um, they have some players to go with it, with the two edge rushers, um, guys that have been doing it for a long time and playing at a high level. Um, and so they, you see the, the, the scheme is working well. The players are playing well. Um, and Jim does a really good job of, of getting a team ready to play. And then, you know, they're in a, a decent spot record-wise because of it. And, um, yeah, we've got to work cut out for us having to go all the way out to L.A. to play as well. Yeah, your first time as a head coach taking a team out west. What's your philosophy on West Coast travel based on – everything you've done throughout your career and the fact that you grew up on the West Coast. Yeah, no, it's a little – it's a, a short, short homecoming in some sorts for me, but um, nothing out of the ordinary for us. You know, you just – we're only going two time zones from here. Um, generally speaking, when you're the, – the issue always occurs when you're coming – when you're going from – west to east and you got to play a early game you know if you're playing a one o'clock kick or you're coming in from california to nashville to play a noon kickoff like you usually take a day earlier um just to acclimate a little bit so you're not waking up and playing at what's you know eight o'clock or nine o'clock right. your time yeah. so going from east to west isn't as big a deal you know it doesn't really bother us as much i don't i don't have anything special we do we'll just we'll We'll pack up, we'll get on a plane, and we'll leave like we always do, and it'll be a normal routine, and um, we'll just be, you know, our body clocks will be later, so it's not that that big of a deal. So to the Titans, it's a 3.05 start, mm -hmm. and It'd that's like, the way you're, you're talking about it. Keeping that consistency in the travel is more important to you than giving a nod toward the fact that it's two hours yeah, away. Yeah, it doesn't do – that doesn't – our consistency is more important, and, again, it's it's more about – it's just an afternoon game for us now all of a sudden as opposed to a morning kickoff. So it doesn't really affect us a whole lot, and we're just going to go keep our consistency in normal routine and, and go play. Let's remind everyone, um, as we thank Brian Callahan for the time as usual, we appreciate it. Thanks for having Especially me. Especially after the win. <laughs> it's much much more fun. It yeah, is. It remind is. you, the game in Los Angeles kicks off at 3.05 Central time. That's 2.05 Eastern. Titans countdown on all of our Titans radio stations starts at 2 o'clock Central Time. Up next, we've got a guest who knows a ton about the Chargers and the entire NFL. It's the man himself, none other than Daniel Jeremiah, NFL Network draft expert. 
co-host of the Move the Sticks podcast with Bucky Brooks, and the man who joins Money Smith to call Los Angeles Chargers games on radio. And earlier this week, Daniel, when I promoted your appearance in the Tri-Cities, you were then referred to as Daniel Jeremiah, former Appalachian State quarterback. (laughs) So whatever you call him, however you know him, you got him right here. Daniel Jeremiah, welcome. But it's great to be with you guys. I always love hanging out, whether we get to do it at the combine, the draft, or, or it feels like the Chargers and Titans do play each other a lot as well. So we get our little bonus meetings in here. Absolutely. And we do see each other a lot, but someone else that we see a lot is Jim Nagy from the Senior Bowl. And next week, we've got him on the show. It's kind of our annual November visit from Executive Director Jim Nagy. He is the Executive Director of the Senior Bowl. And Daniel... If you were the one asking the questions of Jim Nagy next week, what would be your very first question? My very first question for Nagy would obviously be, why didn't you invite more App State players and why, what do you have against them? I mean, that would be <laughs> totally that's the obvious. Yeah. That's the obvious one. The second question I would ask, and maybe, maybe <clears throat> just because I know him, I can get away with this, but... Um, are you taking a Zempic? Because I've seen him get in the shape that I remember being on the road with with Nagy, and I think he's he is he is looking like he's a featherweight right now. So I, I would ask if this is all legit. That's what I would ask Nagy. I think that's a good a good place for us to start is Jim Nagy's training. Well, let's yeah. switch over to the Chargers and their training a little bit because the season's in full swing. And how much time do you personally spend preparing during the week, balancing the Chargers, and then also preparing for the 2025 NFL? Because you do yeah. have a lot of responsibilities throughout the draft and other NFL events. It's interesting that you you bring that question up because um, this the line of demarcation is like Halloween for me. So that's when I know, okay, the draft is – it's like this big – you know, grill that jumps on your back and it's like, okay, I, I try and put it out of my head and I'm going to focus on the chargers, focus on the stuff I'm doing NFL network, NFL, 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 NFL. And then we get to Halloween and it's like, okay, th- there's enough games in the college schedule. Now it doesn't really benefit me to start early on in the process because you know, you, you, the quality of opponents, not necessarily there for some of these programs. It's not a great, uh, you know, litmus test for a lot of these players well now you're deep into the conference play they, they've all played quality opponents so this is like kind of my launching point um and we were just talking before we went on i was in uh in cleveland last week with the chargers got a chance to go watch michigan oregon so it was a good chance to watch some of those players on tape and it was kind of like my uh like just just jumping off the diving board and doing a cannonball into uh, into a pool of players that i'm going to be swimming in for the next several months Speaking of draft, go back to 2024 for a second. From what you've seen around the season and from what you know as you start to prepare for the Titans, your thoughts on the top two picks, J.C. Latham and Tavondre Sweat's rookie years halfway through? Yeah, I'm more familiar with Sweat just from, you know, I'm talking to people around the league when I'm uh, doing the podcast and things, so asking, hey, who's playing well? Who should I watch? Who do you want me to study? And, and uh, who can we talk about on the podcast? And Sweat's name has come up several times. So I've watched a lot of him this year and have been impressed with the way he's played. He's been, I mean, he's been better than I would have hoped he would be. Um, so I've been impressed there. Now, as we're recording this, I haven't got into the Titans uh, stuff this week. So I'll have a chance to see everybody else. I'll get a chance to see Latham, who I was very high on, you know, coming through the draft process, just how talented he was. So I'm excited. And when we get a chance to, to visit in person uh, here on the weekend, uh, you know, we can uh, we can have that conversation. I'm looking forward to studying him. Some news already this week around the NFL. The Raiders have fired offensive coordinator Luke Getze. But the bigger news New Orleans parts ways with head coach Dennis Allen. Highly respected Saints special teams coordinator Darren Rizzi is the interim coach. The Saints have lost seven in a row, but Daniel, what's on the salary cap horizon for New Orleans is scary. I mean scary. Is that going to potentially scare off candidates for the New Orleans full-time position for 2025? Well, I'll tell you what. I mean – the answer I always get when I bring this up with people around the league and is, look, there's only 32 of these things. Like, 
you can't be picky. You don't know when you're going to get your shot or your opportunity. And, you know, you can make any job a good job. You know, they're, they're, it's, just, it's the highest level and there's only so many of these jobs open. But man, you're in a draft which, from the early work that I've done, is not a great quarterback draft. So that's a way to solve some of your financial issues is you get one of these cheap quarterbacks and then you end up, you know, eventually figuring out what to do with Carr. And then you can at least have some savings at that position, the most expensive position. Well, it's not a great opportunity to do that at the top of the draft uh then you look at it okay well we can just cut a bunch of these guys and then we'll take all of our medicine in one year but my based off my initial study and understanding that's not really possible here uh you know to be able to do that to get some savings so it it feels a lot like if you if you have kids mike i know you're with with older kids like me where it's like hey you know that book report I told you about a month ago? Yeah, it's due tomorrow. Like, how are we doing on that thing? Have we started that project yet? Like, it is going to be a mess trying to figure out how to get under the cap and, and field a competitive team, not for next year, maybe for the next couple of years. Let's talk Chargers and new head coach Jim Harbaugh. What are the biggest changes, Daniel, in the Chargers with Jim Harbaugh in charge? They don't beat themselves. I mean... It sounds basic, but when you watch them, I mean, they have the number one scoring defense in the NFL. And you look at it and say, okay, they've got some good, there's some good pieces there. Obviously, you know, Khalil Mack's a great player, going to be a Hall of Fame player. Joey Bosa has not been healthy all year long. Uh, Derwin James has, has been a great player in this league for a long time, but they're playing two fifth round rookie corners. Um, they're playing a young linebacker who's a first year full time starter in Dayon Henley. Uh, Puna Ford, who've been kind of, you know, a serviceable, somewhat, you know, journeyman has played lights out. But this this is what it is. They don't beat themselves. They don't miss tackles. They don't blow coverages. They don't give you anything easy. They make you earn everything from that side of the ball. And then on the offensive side of the ball, they're committed to run the football, even if it's not working, um, which in turn uh, helps keep Justin Herbert in a good place. You know, It lessens the, the hits he takes. It gives your defense rest, keeps them fresh in what they're doing. Um, and then now they've started to see Lad McConkey really come on and become a, a, a key part of this passing game. Quentin Johnston is back in the lineup, and he's taken a big leap from a frustrating first year to a second year. Um, so it's they have an identity. I mean, maybe that's the simplest way to say it. They know exactly who they are and what they are. And, um, you know, you look around this league right now, and I'd, I'd love to get both your takes on it. But, I mean, we're halfway through the season. And I know the year hasn't gone the way, you know, necessarily the Titans would love it. But I look around the league and I'm like, where are all the great teams? I mean, I, I've seen the Kansas City Chiefs. They're undefeated. I mean, the Chargers were down Derwin James. I think they gave up 17 points in that game. Like, even the undefeated Chiefs, I just feel like this year, there's no, there is no great team in the league right now. Best team we've seen is Detroit. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, that, 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 uh, that I've not seen them in person, but their tape every week, they dominate people. They do not play to the level of their opponent. They have been dominating. But to your point, Daniel, it does feel like everyone's kind of bunched up in the middle there, and we still haven't seen a lot of teams separate themselves. And a lot of that comes down to offense and the different offense that we're seeing. When we talk about the Chargers, and you mentioned their commitment to the run game, why is J.K. Dobbins the right running back for the Chargers in 2024 and what they're trying to do? That's a great question. The, the, the thing with J.K. is, Anytime he's been healthy, he's produced. I mean, when he was healthy in Baltimore, he was excellent. He just had the injury bug. Um, but he was highly thought of coming out of college, coming out of Ohio State. I love him. Um, when he's been on the field, he's been great. He knows he knows what this offense looks like with Greg Roman. Um, he has experience there, so there's no learning curve uh, for what they're looking for. He um, he just he he just a perfect fit. Uh, for what they want to do and it's it's got to be nice as a running back and I'm sure with Derrick Henry all those years and I'm not saying he's Derrick Henry but there's that that knowledge of you know what even if we're if we're getting one yards two yards minus one yard uh, uh, there's other play callers and, and teams that'd be like okay scrap that you know let's just throw it uh, there's when you are commit to, a, to be a run team and and you live through the ones and the twos and the zeros and the minus ones then guess what that's where the 40s and the 30s you know and the 28 yard runs start to pop when those teams are committed to it um, so I think I think JK has uh, has a healthy appreciation for being in the situation he's in.
Jim Harbaugh really seems to love quarterback Justin Herbert. Like, really seems to <laughs> love him. Are the Chargers asking Herbert to play anything differently, or how is he adjusting to this new coaching staff? In our conversation with him Friday night, um, I told him, I said, this is a litmus test for where you are as an organization. And if you have championship aspirations, it's Halloween. And he kind of looked at me and I said, if you go out trick or treating and you don't see a lot of kids dressed up as your starting quarterback, then then you're not <laughs> going to win a championship. And that's what I told him. And then he went on and on and on about Justin at that point in time and, and it, with culminating in him saying, I hope he's the last quarterback I ever coach. Like he absolutely loves him. And I there's reason obviously to love him. Justin is is so gifted. He's so big. He's he's so strong. He's athletic. He's smart. He's tough. All the things that you want from that standpoint. But I also think if you go back and look at Harbaugh's track record, everywhere he's been, he's always pumped his quarterback. And he, what he does is he just pumps him full of confidence. And I think about so many of these organizations and teams, they kind of half step on their quarterbacks. Oh, you know, let's see how it goes. And maybe uh, no guarantees who's going to start next week. Like he is, he, it is a full throated endorsement of, uh, I 100% believe in this player. And how does that not have an impact? I, I, I saw it with, with the Rams when they went, when Coach Fisher was there, and it was kind of a defensive team, and Jared Goff was kind of, you know, wasn't playing great. And then Sean McVay came in as an offensive coach and was just, Jared Goff like a totally different player because he just had, you know, he had some real belief in him and what he could do. So um, I, I think it's a pretty powerful technique, to be honest. Well, and part of that is giving him weapons around him to help him out. And he's got a lot of new pass catchers in 2024. Who is standing out the most among those receiving options? I think it's McConkie. Um, and I, you know, I get crushed for it when I say it, but it's like, it's so obvious. Like you watch him, like he looks like Julian Edelman. He looks just like him when he's out there in the slot. He's so quick. Um, I, I think a lot of times with the with receivers that, that can play inside and we talk about quickness and we think about getting off the line of scrimmage and then we think of, okay, it gets to the top of his route. How quick can he sink and separate? His ability after he is squared up to the quarterback to catch the ball and then transition back upfield and get seven, eight, nine extra yards. Um, I just I, I saw Edelman do that for so many years. And he's got the trust of Herbert. I mean, Keenan Allen was his like little security blanket. Anytime you had a big down, that's where the ball was going. You knew it. And he had uh, the utmost faith in him. All these new players around him, as we're getting deeper into the season, I, I'm, I kind of pay attention to those key downs. And I'm like, okay, you better find Ladd McConkey because that's who Herbert has really, really gained some trust in. Daniel Jeremiah, who among the former Tennessee Titans are standing out most on the current Los Angeles Chargers roster. Molden's been a godsend, um, you know, and he's still young. He just jumped right in to the lineup and kind of found a role and, and, and picked everything up, learned everything right away. He's just kind of been a ball magnet. He's always around the ball. There was a play, you know, uh, where his, his interception that he got this last week, Tarheep still is in the in the corner of the end zone. He makes a heck of a play and bats the ball up in the air. And it's like, I could have told you before the ball came down that Elijah Bolton was going to be there waiting for it because he just kind of has, has found a way to be right place, right time. And when you've got Derwin James, who's so you know versatile in the things he can do, you got a Louis Gilman who's like the traffic cop who's going to you know uh, get everybody lined up. Elijah Molden can just kind of be the football player in their three safety looks, and he's been really, really good. The Harbaugh family loves special teams. Loves special teams. Have you seen a change in special teams philosophy, and have you seen special teams improvement this year? Well, coming off the Cleveland game, and when you get a chance to, to dig in on the video, you'll see it. I mean, you have uh, – Darius Davis with a long kick return. You know, he'd been there. Uh, this is his second year, but he's he's an outstanding returner. Uh, he makes a big-time return. Tier Tart, who was an, un, an awesome addition by Joe Ortiz, the general manager, coming over from Miami as a defensive tackle. He blocks a field goal in this game. Um, I know he's he actually missed uh, an extra point, and, and uh, I believe he missed a field goal as well. Yeah, he did miss his first field goal. He's missed under 50 yards for Cameron Dicker. But he's been as accurate as any kicker in the league. So a lot of these players, you know, were here outside of Tart before Harbaugh got here. And it's the same special teams coach with Ficken, who's one of the best in the league. So, you know, Coach Harbaugh, 
his brother John and obviously being a special teams coach before head coach, I'm sure they spend you know a, a good amount of time on this. But this is a special team group that even in the the absence of success as a team last year, you could see some of the signs that okay they've got they've got a returner, they've got a kicker, they've got J.K. Scott's been an excellent punter. Um, so they are they are truly one of the best special teams in the NFL, and I think it's emphasized. Um, but I, I think I would on that one particularly, I would give some credit to you know to the previous group who who put some of those guys in place. How would you characterize the Chargers' defense under new coordinator Jesse Minter? Disciplined, organized. Uh, the maybe the the best visual of it is if you guys are watching these games every week, there's something that's so simple to see. And if you're watching at home as a fan, you'll see it. Do you see like the the bad defenses always seem like they're chaotic? You know, it's like there's a there's a there's guys running on the field late to try and match personnel. There's trying to get a call and communication. It's there's none of that. Jesse Minner has has it, and I don't know if he just has simplified things with what they do. They give you a lot of simulated pressures and some exotic looks, but I never see chaos, and that's why you don't see busted coverages. You don't see mental mistakes. Um, they spend a lot of time working on angles for tackles. I know in the NFL, you know, one of the challenges for teams is that you don't really, you don't hit as much in practice and you got to get guys healthy and keep them through the 17 game gauntlet. So you can't tackle like that. Well, he's, he's, he's a big believer in tackling, you know, more so than even, you know, form tackling the Seahawk method, whatever way you want to teach people to tackle people. His thing is if you don't take the right angle, it doesn't matter. So they spend a lot of times on knowing where leverage is, knowing where you've got other defenders coming to help you. So if you are going to miss, you're going to be on the right side to force him back to your teammates. But they are, uh, you know, they are a really good tackling team. And I think that's, you know, one of the, one of the underrated things of great defense is everybody's, oh, pass rush, third down, red zone, like all those important things. But at the end of the day, it's still tackling. You have to be able to tackle guys, and they do it really well. Well, let's talk about some of those pass rushers, though, because the Chargers mm-hmm. have a lot of them. Khalil Mack is the more well-known name, but who else is making a difference in the pass rush? Yeah, two guys I would say, uh, uh, Tuli Tui Pelotu, uh, coming off a two-and-a-half sack game against the Cleveland Browns, has been a great player uh, out of USC. He's he's kind of in that mold of, of Khalil. Khalil's a power rusher. Um, that's what he's going to do as well. He's going to try and, and get you off balance and go right through your pads. He's really physical. Um, and he's been kind of that when they're healthy, when they're at their best is when Bosa's healthy, which he's not right now. Uh, Mac is rolling. And then Tuli's kind of that third rusher. And they'll put them all out there together um, and, and run games and do different things. But Tuli's been a really good player. And then maybe more of the more underappreciated players is Morgan Fox, uh, who's an interior pass rusher who can – a little bit undersized but excellent just kind of getting on edges and getting up the field Um, so you know when you have the edge rush that they have every quarterback is going to try and climb up in the pocket to get away from it so you got to have somebody inside that can can take that away and that's kind of been morgan fox's daniel jeremiah how close is joey bosa to getting back to being joey bosa you know, I don't know if he would put a percent on it. I, his snap count's very limited. He's playing, you know, mostly on pass rush situations. I haven't seen the number from this last game, but I'm, uh, the week before, I want to say you're talking 20 to 25 snaps. So, I mean, I, just off my naked eye, I would say Joey's probably 50, 60 percent, um, and that's about it. But he's still, he's someone you have to account for. Um, he still got found a way to get some pressure last week against Cleveland. He just knows how to rush. It's like we always joke it's the family business. I mean, with, with him and Nick. They, they really do, by the way, go to a park in Florida and work on pass rush. Like your kids are probably there playing on the jungle gym. And uh, you look over and there's two of the highest paid, best defensive linemen in the NFL working hand moves uh, in pass rush. So they, they are obsessed with it uh, all the way up to their, their dad. But um, he's not he's not anywhere near uh, 100%, but he's still found a way to be impactful. But I, you know, as, as someone who's always enjoyed watching defensive line play and I watched uh, just a cut up this morning cause I wanted to see it. I, I, Jeffrey Simmons might be my favorite defensive lineman to watch in the NFL. So I, I'm selfishly looking forward to a fun uh, defensive line matchup in this ball game. Overall, what's the biggest concern about this chargers football team as the season hits its midway point, Daniel? 
If you'd asked me that two weeks ago, I would have said corners. Um, they've had some injuries. They're having to play a lot of young guys. But these two fifth round picks, uh, rookies, you know, Cam Hart and, and Tarheep still are just getting better and better every week. They've played really well. Well, with Asante Samuel being out, Asante Samuel Jr. Junior being out, uh, just your Taylor's been hurt. Uh, Fulton, who had been playing well, is uh, you know has been hurt. So these young guys have stepped in there. So I, I would say I feel better about that than maybe I did a few weeks back. Uh, my biggest concern probably is is, and this will be interesting in this game is interior offensive line against the pass. Like as it, pass protection with the interior group hasn't been great. The two tackles, Slater and Alt, as long as they're not having to play against Miles Garrett. Have been awesome. Yeah, Miles Garrett, <laughs> yeah. he's a freak show. He put on a show in that game last week. He's unbelievable. But uh, for the most part this year, it's been kind of, you know, center guards have, have had some issues. And that's why it'll be interesting to see. I bet you in this ball game against Tennessee, Greg Roman, I wouldn't be surprised if he kind of moves Herbert around a little bit and not let not let those two defensive tackles you know, just completely wreck a ball game. If the 2024 Los Angeles Chargers are really going to make a run down the stretch and then make some noise in January, what needs to happen? Well, health is the obvious one, right? You know, if you get Joey Bosa back to being 100%, that would be a big part of it. Um, that takes the defense to another level. But I think that the the growth of the weapons around Justin would probably be it. I mean, he's, he is playing at a very high level right now uh, at the quarterback spot. And it's like, okay, well, if you can get – McConkie just keeps getting better. Quentin Johnson's coming off a 100-yard game. Maybe he's getting some confidence. He can keep getting better. They have a lot of guys with upside that aren't near their potential at this point in time. So if they're going to make a run, I think it's those guys continuing to grow, uh, really truthfully, as they have been over the last month or so. Daniel Jeremiah, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's great to be with you. Hey, Titans fans, SeatGeek makes it easy to find tickets so you can be a part of all the touchdown celebrations this season. Whether you're buying or selling football tickets, SeatGeek is the place to do it. SeatGeek is the official primary ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. The most disruptive idea in ticketing, a ticket that works. Expect the expected. SeatGeek. SeatGeek. <laughs> <laughs> Made a rookie mistake this football season? Maybe you should have had a Snickers. Because now you can enter for the chance to turn those rookie mistakes into prizes, including a trip to Super Bowl 59. Visit snickers.com slash rookie mistakes for details. For head coach Brian Callahan and for Daniel Jeremiah, along with Amy Wells, I'm Mike Keith, thanking you for joining us for the OTP.